Well, as we gather this morning, uh, we continue on in this series, and, uh, and we're, we're sitting with this notion of peace, this idea of peace. And uh, for those of you, you may have friends or you may have family or you may even recount this tradition. There's the Advent tradition where there's a different theme every week of Advent and some people use candles to reflect that and light candles and, and do that type of thing. And uh, that's a wonderful way to prepare our hearts for Christmas. But we've been sitting with themes this year and last year and the year before that even. Instead of kind of just spending one week on a particular theme, we've been just sitting with a theme for the whole Christmas season. And so we want to sit with peace. And I I realized something this week is like, so I've just been thinking about it and my goal is to have you thinking about it for all these weeks leading up to Christmas Day. And as I was thinking about it this week, I realized something. Peace is a wonderful thing to strive for and it's a noble thing to strive for and I'm all about it and I've been reading scriptures and thinking about it, immersing myself in this topic, but it's all well and good, I found out this week, until somebody cuts me off in traffic. (laughs) And then it just takes on a whole different meaning. Right, And so when we really have to live life and spend time out in the world in which we live, it's all well and good early in the morning when all is quiet and I'm reading about peace in God's word. But then I go out into the world and realize, well, it's not always easy. And that's what we heard my friend Pilate talking about this morning. And I'm so glad, and he was very kind, the words he said about me personally as he began. But as I shared with you a couple weeks ago, uh, I've reached out to some of my friends in different parts of the world who I'm learning from, and whether they realize it or not, I'm learning from them, and that's how it should be, this mutual learning back and forth. And I have a great admiration for a young man like Pilate who lives where he lives and shares openly about some of his struggles of extending peace and yet is following Jesus faithfully. So I'm so thankful today for Pilate and him just uh, sharing with us what it is to be a peacemaker in his context, which is not a very easy place to be a peacemaker. And so as we go into God's word today, we heard Jonathan read a little bit from Romans and that passage, which is a challenge. We're going to talk about being peacemakers And there is one passage of scripture, it's really one sentence that really encompasses what we're talking about today very clearly. And and so I want to read that for you, one sentence, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It's in a group of, uh, or a set of Jesus' teachings known as the Beatitudes, that's what we've come to call it. And there's a number of these, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And we get to this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. If you have your Bibles, I I always hope that you use them. If you have your devices, I always hope you use them as Bibles at this point and not for other reasons. But Matthew Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, that's so short. That's such, that's such a concise sentence that you know, I think you can help me read the scripture today. All right, so let's read that together. It's, there it is on the screen behind me. Matthew 5, verse 9. Read it with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. See how easy it is to read scripture? So you all go to volunteer to read next week, right? Right up here. It didn't hurt at all. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. We just want to sit with this for a moment. For a few minutes this morning, we want to sit with this idea that we are challenged, we are called to be peacemakers. Now, last week, I spent our time together talking about that word peace and and talked a little bit about the the root word or the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, which is shalom. And we talked about how we don't always grasp the fullness of what it is to have peace because we don't always grasp the fullness of that word shalom. Well, there's a word in this passage of scripture, there's a word that I think is another word that we throw around. 
We throw it around often. We use it in ways that maybe it was never meant to be intended to. Or, or maybe, th- I'll say this, there's a deeper meaning. And that's the word blessed. And, and often we'll say, I'm so blessed. Right? And, and in our way of thinking, and in our Western world, what that often means is it's referring to things are going well in our lives, or, or we're comfortable, or, or things are going well in our family, and, and it really often has to do with the situation. And yet, when we look at that word in Scripture, and when we unpack that word and pull back the layers... It doesn't always have to do with the situation. All right, I, I, shout it out if you know the answer to this question and you're here. I mean, if you're online, you can type it in, I guess. But who's called blessed in the story leading up to Jesus' birth? In that nativity story, in the Christmas story, who is called blessed? Mary. Excellent. You're reading the word. Excellent. Mary's called blessed. Now think about Mary's situation for a minute. Think about it for a minute. She was young. She was engaged to be married. And now she's pregnant. Okay, that situation is a little... You got to admit. And, and you might... You know, we might be looking at it from a lens of our day and age, and maybe, you know, we'd say, well, don't cast judgment. But the reality of the situation that she finds herself in would not have been comfortable. There would have been nothing comfortable for Mary walking around telling people and getting larger and larger, and and people knowing that she was betrothed to Joseph and engaged to be married, and now she's pregnant. That wouldn't be comfortable. And yet she's called blessed. And I've never been pregnant, just in case you didn't. I mean, we have, but I say that realizing I've never. But I can't imagine traveling as she had to travel with Joseph. Like, was she thinking all the way? Blessed. (laughs) I'm blessed. Right? And then as she's laying in the stable, the stable fit for a king, and having a baby, was she thinking, well, she, based on what we read in Scripture, she was. She was. Some of the words, she realized she was blessed, but from the outside looking in, would we have maybe called her that? We can. How many thousands of years later, we can look at her and say, oh, she was blessed. But in that moment, is that what people were saying about Mary? And so to be blessed is not necessarily about the situation. It's not about what's going on around us all the time. It's about who is in us, who is walking with us. You know, what I've come to realize When people are going through struggle, and I I see that often, when they say, talk about blessing, you know what they're talking about? Most often, they're talking about the presence of people in their lives. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about people. They're talking about relationships. And when people are going through a hard time, they want presence. They want people with them. They want to know somebody is there. And so when we think about that whole area of blessing, God's greatest blessing always rests with God and his presence. And so as we read this passage, blessed are the peacemakers. We realize that it is the presence of God that is with people that are seeking to make peace or bring shalom. So doesn't mean that peacemakers are going to be rich. In fact, I think there's a good argument that those who set out to make shalom and peace may not always have a lot of things. 
It's about the presence of God being with those of us who set out to make peace. And who are called children of God? Who are called children of God? Is the people that believe the right things or have the right opinions or have all the money? No, the people that are called children of God are peacemakers, are people that set out to make peace. You see, the scripture tells us that we are image bearers. Way back in the beginning, there's something about us as a creation of God that bears his image. And as image bearers, God's people, God's children are to be peacemakers. Why? Well, because God is a God of peace. God is a God of peace. So if God is a God of peace, then his children who are following in his footsteps, so to speak, should be people of peace. Pilate said it well. If anybody in a community should be known as peacemakers, it should be Christians. It should be the people of God. And so we need to think about that as we're getting cut off in traffic. We need to think about that as people aren't treating us the way we think we should be treated. That passage that Jonathan read for us earlier from Romans 12 is a challenging, challenging passage. I often think to myself, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that scare me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that scare me. (laughs) Because when I look at them and I think, oh my goodness, that's hard. That's not easy. Romans 12 verse 18 said this, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As peacemakers, and Matthew 5, verse 9, of course, are the words of Jesus. So as peacemakers, we're called to be peacemakers, and and we are blessed with the presence of God when we are. Then Paul goes on a little further to try and help the people see that we have to work at this and we have to do all that is possible and we have to do all that we can. Often we want to say, yeah, but, but, but the other person. Don't worry about the other person. God will worry about the other person. We have to do all that we can and we have to do everything we can as far as it depends on us to live at peace with everyone. Now, I realize that there's a phrase there, if it is possible. So that would suggest that there may be times where we just have to remove ourselves from a situation or a relationship. But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is not to say, oh, yeah, it's not possible. We should not be saying over and over again, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. If we are, we need to look in the mirror and say, maybe I'm not willing to go as far as I need to. Maybe I'm not willing to do as much as I need to, to be a peacemaker. Peacemakers prioritize relationships and they pursue reconciliation. That's what it is to be a peacemaker. To be someone that makes peace, we prioritize relationships and we pursue reconciliation. There's all kinds of things in this world that we can pursue. There's all kinds of things in this world that we can prioritize. This is a perfect time of year to see the different things that people prioritize and pursue. And people are going to tell you over and over again what you should prioritize and what you should pursue. It's called advertising. And it's everywhere. People are trying to get you to prioritize this or that or the other thing. They're trying to get you to pursue this, that, or the other thing. And it's not always things. Sometimes it's activities. Because when we talk about prioritizing things, yes, it has to do with where we spend our money, but it also has to do with where we spend our time, our energy, our efforts. We can tell what's important to people, what they're prioritizing, what they're pursuing based on where they spend their time, how they spend their time. 
Well, peacemakers prioritize relationships and they pursue reconciliation. And so we are thinking about people. We are thinking about how do we restore what God has intended. How can we help people become, yes, closer to God, but closer to who he wants them to be? Uh, my friend, Pilate, he, he has all kinds of challenges in, in the ministry that has, he's involved in. He's just a young pastor, you could probably tell from that. I met Pilate when he was quite uh, just a teenager, when I was in Cameroon in, in 20, that would have been 2012. Some of us got to meet Pilate, and he was a wonderful young man then, and he was being mentored, but he faces all kinds of challenges in ministry. And that's why, for me, it's important to, to, to consider what he experiences so that I don't get locked into my own little world and, and prioritize and pursue the wrong things. But as I think of Pilate, and, and I have this amazing opportunity when, when their connection is okay over there to converse with him a little bit and to hear a little bit about the things that he, he does to pursue peace. And, and, and the steps that he takes, literally the steps, the steps that he takes. And uh, so, so earlier this fall, we were kind of messaging back and forth at one point, and he, was, he sent me this picture. He's like, oh, God is so good. I have this motorcycle. And now, because literally he was taking steps, that's the only way he could get around the village to his people. And so he was taking steps, but he has this opportunity to have this motorcycle. And he's like, oh, I have this motorcycle. I have this motorcycle, and I'm so excited. And, uh, and motorcycles are, are a, an important way for them to get around. So if he could have a motorcycle, he has just opportunities, and his time could be spent much more efficiently. He said, yeah, I have this motorcycle, but unfortunately, like, the motorcycle doesn't work. I'm like, oh, well, praise God for motorcycles that don't work, right? So he's messaging me, and, and he's like, yeah, but, but maybe just the Lord will provide. Maybe the Lord will provide. And, and, and he's like, yeah, and I really think that maybe you know, God will provide, and he'll get this bike fixed up. And he sent me the number. I think it was like $88,000. Okay, not our dollars, but like a big number in their money that he needed to fix this motorcycle. And he's like, would you please pray, Pastor? Will you just pray? I'm like, yeah, I'll pray. That makes sense to me. Like, you need a way to get around to be more efficient and effective with your time. If you're out there trying to make peace with your people and in the village. So I started praying. And then, I, you know, as I was finishing and I put my, my phone down and, and then, you know, I turned on my Apple CarPlay and I was like, yeah, this is great. And I turned on the heated seat in my new RAV4 and I'm like, why am I praying about this? Right? Like what? Like now, prayer is important. We're having a prayer vigil tonight for peace, and I would encourage you all to be here. Prayer is important, but prayer is just kind of the first step. So I went to uh, I went to a, a Tuesday morning Bible study men's group that I went to, and I'm like, guys, I just kind of really feel convicted that that we should do something um, because here's Pilate, and we're all driving around and. Most of us are driving around in a vehicle, and most of us probably have two vehicles in our yard. So I was just like, we just we we need to do something about this. So I just said, here's what I here's what I know. It's like a couple hundred bucks Canadian. And then I used a line that one of our former treasurers has used here. I said to them, and just so you know, not all good deeds are tax receivable. Right? In other words, because of the way this needs to work, like we're just going to put some cash together and we're just going to do the right thing. Now, I don't do that often because I don't think as your pastor I should be coming around doing that very often. But in that moment, I just felt really convicted and convinced. And so I started the pot and the pot has grown and, and the, the pot of money got sent and now we're, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for a picture of Pilot on the motorcycle with the big smile on his face with it all fixed up. And you're like, Pastor, why'd you tell that story? Because that's peacemaking you're like, well, how is that peacemaking? Well, friends, 
if I'm going to sit in a brand new vehicle, and I can justify it in all kinds of ways, as you can too, but I'm not going to sit in a brand new vehicle and simply pray for a, cup, for a pastor that's asked me to pray, knowing that if he could just get around easier, he could minister in a way that would be much more effective. He wants to prioritize relationships. He wants to pursue reconciliation, and he wants to do that within his village, but it takes him so much longer to do that because he just doesn't have that motorcycle working. And so peacemaking is not only praying. It is praying, but it's not only praying. As I mentioned, tonight we're going to engage in peacemaking through prayer. Don't worry, I won't come asking for motorcycle money tonight, okay? Just so you know, no offering tonight. And yet, peacemaking involves so many things to restore and bring reconciliation and recognize relationships and priority. The priority of sharing Jesus. And as you heard from Pilate, even in those short moments, that is his priority. Peacemaking requires humility. Peacemaking requires humility. And I, I think it's fair to say that when I was messaging back and forth, there was a moment when I kind of was humbled. <laughs> and I think we as God's people and many of us, not all of us, I know some of us are struggling and I know people in our own context are struggling and we're working to help those folks too. But I also think we have to remember and be humbled at some points. Because peacemaking requires humility. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 14 again. This is what Paul wrote. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Then he goes on a little bit later to say, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. That's peacemaking. But it's, it, it's, it's very humbling. It takes humility. It takes humility to say, you know what? You might have mistreated me, but I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide something for you. I'm going to feed you. But that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about being peacemakers, it sounds all well and good, but now we're talking about, I want you to think about the person that you just can't stand. You're like, no, no, pastor. I'm a Christian. I get along with everybody. Really? So everybody. There's nobody that you're kind of just a little bit annoyed with right now? Nobody in your family? Nobody in your workplace? Nobody that's done a bad deal with you in business? Nobody that's rubbed you the wrong way? Like, let's get real when it talk, we're talking about peacemaking. Somebody that's just like, they're the most annoying person in the world. Well, this week, you've got to bake them cookies. Well, maybe not. Because if you're a bad baker, that might be like, <laughs> that might not be blessing them. But let's get real about what we're reading. To be a peacemaker is to do something very unexpected. Because the expected thing is if somebody treats me in a way that I don't appreciate, I might just treat them back. At the very least, I'm going to ignore them. But here we're being told, you know, if you have somebody that's your enemy, that you can't get along with, that you think is annoying, that has done something wrong, then you're, you're to go out of your way to, to be kind to them. You're to go out of your way to bless them. The Jesus way is a different way. Peacemaking is different than what we see lived out day to day in the world. And it requires courage. It requires a great deal of courage to trust God that if we step out in faith and if we, instead of allowing someone to continue this cycle of mistreatment, if we say, no, no, I'm going to treat you with respect even though you don't treat me with respect. That's what it is to be a peacemaker, and it takes courage because now we're trusting God. We're trusting God with the outcome. We're trusting God to be the one to settle the score, 
Romans 12, 19 said, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. See, our, our call, our job, is to be peacemakers. It's God's place to decide how he holds people accountable for how they treat us. Now, please, I'm not suggesting that if you're in a situation where someone is, is treating you poorly and if there's abuse or anything like that, I'm not suggesting that you should just sit there and take it. Okay, so don't use what I'm saying Especially, don't use it if you are the person doing the nasty things. Sometimes, making peace is stepping away and separating yourselves. You know, I know that. I'm a parent. In the moment, sometimes it's like, okay, you go to that corner and you go to that corner, <laughs> right? You go to your room, you go to your room. <laughs> and so sometimes we have to separate ourselves and yet what we're reading here, a radical, radical call to peacemaking. And it requires humility, and it requires courage. And as I've already alluded to, it requires action. Peacemaking suggests that we are doing something. That whole word, so we've got peace, and we've got what? Making. If you're going to make something, you're doing something. It's an action. Tonight, a, a small group that I'm a part of, we felt led to, to lead this prayer vigil tonight. We want to invite people because that is doing something. Prayer is doing something. Don't misinterpret my story from earlier to say that prayer isn't doing something. We just need to be prepared when we pray that God might push us even a little bit further. But prayer is doing something. And so it does always begin with prayer. And so my small group has really come around and, and taken hold of the small group I'm part of on Sunday evenings and said, yeah, we just want to come and welcome people to come and then guide them in some prayer for themselves, for their families, because there's just a lot of stuff right now. People are dealing with a lot of things. So tonight will be a quiet, safe space to pray for yourself, to pray for your family, to pray for your community and pray for the world we live in. No one will ask you to do anything or pray out loud or do anything you're not comfortable with, but it will be a, a place of quiet reflection and prayer. Prayer is not passive. It is an active thing that we're doing when we pray because we believe it's powerful. And so I invite you to that. I invite you to come and just be and be praying. But we can act in other ways too. We need to act in other ways too because peacemaking is taking action. And, and I believe that we see, this time of year, I believe we see elements of what this time of year is all about because we see a lot of action this time of year, don't we? People are very generous this time of year trying to help different organizations do all kinds of good things. And in a way, I think people are trying to, to make peace. They're trying to bring wholeness, completeness, shalom. But it, it can't just be one time of year, right? That's part of the problem. We try and do it all <laughs> at once. Because peacemaking is an ongoing process where it requires humility, courage, action, ongoing. With the goal, and what is the goal of peacemaking? The goal of peacemaking is restoration. That's, that's the goal. The goal is to restore shalom. It's to restore peace. It's to restore harmony. It's to see all of his creation flourish. How do I know that? That the goal of peacemaking is restoration? Because in the beginning, in the beginning, there was shalom. We see that in Genesis. And in the end there will be peace, right? We see it. It bookends this, our, our wonderful sacred text. We see peace with God, and we will see peace with God. And so in the meantime, the goal of those who call themselves children of God is to bring about in big and small ways, however best we can, peace. To restore his creation. God wants to see creation, all of creation restored. He wants his creation to flourish. 
He wants us to be whole and complete. He wants us to live in harmony with one another. We know this, and we know to the extent to which he was willing to go to make peace with us because he sent his son, Jesus. So this is, has very much been, I, I, I pray you've heard the challenge. This is a challenge to, to go out of your way to make peace to do as much as you can, as far as it depends on you, to live at peace with one another. That's the challenge. But we're doing that because we're following God's lead, recognizing that he was willing to send his son to make peace. And that Jesus was willing to go about his life in such a way that he would bring peace. This is what we read in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. These are the words of Jesus. They're actually, they're actually the words of the prophet Isaiah. And remember, we've been in the prophet Isaiah for a couple of weeks. He was telling about this Messiah that would come to bring peace. And in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, Jesus stands before them. He's grown up now. And he stands before them in the temple. He stands before them and says this, reads this the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor he has set sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the lord's favor or his blessing he closed up that scroll and he said this has come true today in your midst this is why i'm here Jesus came to make peace. And look at what peace looked like. It's good news. Peace is good news. Peace is freedom for those who have been imprisoned. Peace is physical healing. It's setting those who have been treated unjustly free. And so, this is what it is to be a peacemaker. It's to follow in the steps of Jesus. It's not always easy. It's very humbling at times. It takes courage. It takes action. But it's what God asks of us. To be makers of peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you were willing to be the peacemaker. God, you, you did all that you could. And we are grateful. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he came to restore to make peace in all of creation. And Father, it starts in our hearts and then it goes out and flows out from there. Help us, God, to hear your word today. Help us to understand what it is to be a peacemaker. And help us to live in such a way that we prioritize relationships, we pursue reconciliation, we seek restoration in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, in our world. God, I thank you. Thank you for the challenge. It's not easy. But thank you, God, that you go with us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God.